Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Akon. Assalamu alaikum. How you guys doing? Good morning. Or are we in afternoon already? I don't know, I'm having some uh, wire difficulties here. Testing, one, two, testing, testing. All right, there we go. How you doing? So, I would like to start by asking, pretty much answering. Uh, my brother Talil asked me what drives me as I was sitting down here. And I thought to myself, that'd be a great way to start. What drives me the most, and it took some time for me to travel, understand, and realize my purpose in life. But what drives me every day when I wake up, when I go to achieve, or when I go to go after something, I always put the spiritual side before. And it has a lot to do with when I was a child growing up in Senegal and the suffering and the struggle. But I never wanted to make a move, personal, entertainment, business alike, or anything without, after achieving or making that decision, that I would feel good to know that God is smiling upon me. So what drives me the most is the thought of understanding that my part that I play on this earth has to mean something. And I didn't want to just be known for singing and dancing. So it can be very easy to get caught up this business of entertainment, whew. <laughs> I don't have to say much. You know what comes with it. And success, as amazing as it is, can be the one thing to help you lose your way. And fortune, that's abundance that constantly comes, can be even easier to assist you in losing your way. Now, when I was a child, I was in Senegal, I had no electricity. My family, we was under uh, straw huts, kerosene lamps, candles. This was our electricity. As far as clean water, between my parents, my sisters, aunties, aunts, they went to the local well, they dug up the water, put it on their head, came back to the house. This is the same water that we drank from, cooked from, and bathed from. Now, mind you, as a child, this was perfect for me. I, I felt amazing. I knew did nothing different. I was just happy. I was happy because I was surrounded by family all the time. We ate good food, and it was always great conversation, and I knew I was surrounded by people that cared for me. So I didn't really, in no way, feel that as a struggle. Now, my dad was a forward thinker. He was a jazz musician, and he always thought of tomorrow. He never really made a decision without thinking about us in the future. So he came to the United States. Now, my pops was uh, invited by Miss Catherine Dunham in a dance group of Alvin Ailey. I don't know if you guys ever heard of them, but they're huge in the U.S. as far as culture and culture from a standpoint of just influencing culture in general. And Pops wanted to make sure that when we were born, we were born in a place of opportunity. So every time my mom was pregnant with one of us, he would send her to America, we would be born, and he'd ship us back to Africa. <laughs> 
Because he always said he wanted us to grow up understanding our culture, understanding and learning our language, and most of all, understanding our history and where we really came from. So when I was about eight, he shipped us back to America. I started going to school there. And I realized just how different life was when I came to America. Because for the first time, I used to always see this little birdie looking like thing that flew in the sky. And I always thought it was a bird, which was an airplane. So we get to the airport, and I'm flying in this airplane, and I'm scared to death. I don't know what to expect. I jump in this thing, and all of a sudden, because I'm used to like the horse carriage, you know? And I get in this plane, and it's taken off, and I'm in the air. Can you imagine this little African village kid in an airplane looking down? Probably the most scariest moment of my life. Then we get to America, and as we're landing, I'm seeing these huge, tall buildings and skyscrapers, some I've never seen before. Now, mind you, I'm living in a village, so I rarely saw cars unless someone from government was actually driving in. But when I got to America, I seen abundance of vehicles, SUVs, things that I've never ever seen in my life. Then my dad takes us to our house that we live in, and he feeds us frosted flakes. Now, this had to have been the most delicious cereal I ever tasted in my life. And I saw this tiger in front of it, and I'm trying to figure out why is this tiger on a box of cereal? <laughs> that was my first marketing lesson. It took years for me to understand why that tiger was there. Then I would watch TV. Now, mind you, I've never really watched TV before. Thank you. Right? So I'm watching TV, and I see this tiger talking to me. <laughs> and I'm like, tigers can talk? <laughs> Already, I'm seeing my second lesson of marketing. And this blew me away because I'd never seen animation of anything. So everything was new to me. So mind you, I'm coming to a place where there's nothing but straight different culture. So I'm having a huge culture shock, and I'm now going to school. I rarely speak English. I'm this very dark kid with very nappy hair and don't speak English. And I'm meeting all these younger kids who look down on Africans. Because at that time, in America, the racial thing was very, very rough. So African Americans were already having a hard time. So you can only imagine an African. So I used to get into a lot of fights when I was younger, more because I wanted to kind of fit in. And I kind of felt in so many different ways that I didn't fit in. And I didn't know how to really speak English, so my aggression just came through violence. And through the process of that, I found myself always fighting to the point where the kids thought that I was crazy. So whenever there was a new kid that came into the school, they would always utilize him as a token of, uh, you could say, laughter. And would be like, you know, that kid is crazy and I would dare you to say something to him or about him because they knew that I would just lash out and just get really crazy. So that being a token of my personality, it also attracted a certain audience or a certain crowd, per se, at the time that I didn't really quite understand, but I got accepted by all the so-called cool kids, which were the ghetto kids at the time, who were good in sports and was always fighting. So I was taught a specific way of thinking, which became later to be known as hustling. So now the hustle I caught from being in that audience, in that crowd, in that environment. And I started to realize that these kids were people I can kind of relate to because they were poor as well. And they lived in the projects. And the projects are 
buildings, per se, that the government subsidized for un, you know, people that doesn't make much money, and they lived on welfare and things of that nature. So I was always in that area, and I found myself very comfortable in that area because it reminded me of how I used to live back home in Africa, surrounded by friends, family, we play hide and go seek, you know, all the fun stuff. But then in the process of that, there were always ways of how they survived. And they always found ways to do it out of nothing. So while these kids were hustling and creating their own jobs, I'm soaking all of that in. But then I would go back home to the suburbs with family, because Pops had a good job at that time, and Pops used to always think that I would be the black sheep of the family, because I was the one that always went the other way. While my brother Muhammad was in school, making straight A's, I'm skipping school, making money. <laughs> so that was the balance. So it became to the point where I started creating my own job in school. In my locker room, I had a locker that was full of candy, potato chips, to the point I started graduating and started getting more information. Then I started getting test questions and books. So I started selling candy, test questions, <laughs> books, and later information. Now the information became more valuable than anything because I started to realize why I was even in school for more information. So information became the key to everything I moved forward towards because I started to realize how important information was. Even though I wasn't getting the information parents thought that I needed in school at that time, I was getting information from experience in the streets. So it gave me a specific way of how to, out, to look at things in a different light. Then I started getting more entrepreneurial and deeper in the streets, which was quite the wrong direction that I thought at the time I was supposed to be going, not realizing that that direction later will save my life. So, and I'm telling you the story to give you a full picture. And as I got into the streets, I started hanging around more and more experienced hustlers. And there was a movie that came out called Coming to America with Eddie Murphy. And everyone thought that Africans were kings with princes and had a lot of money. So I used that to my advantage. And I used to go around school and say, you know, yeah, my dad's a king, you know, I'm a prince. And the American kids, they, they believed it. So while they're believing that, I'm with the hustlers. And at the time in New Jersey, where I was living, it was the car theft capital of the world. So everybody in the hood drove in stolen cars. So I saved up and bought a stolen car, and I drove to school, and I realized how much praise I was getting for that Porsche. That was my first car, by the way. And the girls start looking at me, you know, a certain way. The fellas start giving me respect. And I said, man, what if I was the guy selling the cars rather than the one that was just driving them? So I learned the game. They taught me chop shops, VIN numbers. I perfected it so well that I became the leading car theft dealer in New Jersey. And then I heard that there was Olympics going on in Atlanta. And my dad at the time was the professor at Clark Atlanta for cultural exchange. And I was a you know, nice basketball player, so I got a scholarship to go to Georgia Tech. But while I'm going to Georgia Tech for scholarship in basketball, I'm ranked number one in soccer in New Jersey. But at the time, soccer just wasn't popular enough. So I went to Atlanta, took the opportunity. And I realized in the South, everything was just slow. It wasn't like the New Jersey hustle. So I said, oh, this is perfect. So I set up shop started creating my own opportunity in New Jersey. And within one year, I was making a million dollars a month in stolen cars. Now, at this time, 
I just knew that I had an empire. My only goal was to be rich. I didn't care how or when. I just wanted to be rich. So with a successful car theft operation in Atlanta, I'm not realizing that one day I'm going to get caught because everything is just so perfect and I'm so smart. And that day comes. I'm driving down the highway and I see a helicopter above me. I didn't really pay it no mind until I went home, went to the store, and everywhere I went, I just seen a helicopter. I'm like, why is this thing following me? So I said, let me just test it and see if it's actually following me. So I started riding down the 285, which is a circle. I went around that circle five times and it stayed there. And that's when I said, okay, you know what? I'm gonna get caught. I just felt that something in my soul told me, when you get off this exit, make a right. And what did I do? I make a left. And as soon as I made the left, they came from everywhere. Get on the ground, get on the floor. And I'm like, okay, okay. And I get locked up. So now I'm in county jail in DeKalb County in Atlanta. Now, mind you, before I got locked up, I can tell you now because everything is good. But before I got locked up, I always had this habit because I was into illegal business, so I couldn't really tell people what I was doing or what I was going through in my life, so I used to just write about them. I would write songs about what was going on in my life, and you know, so that was my way of kind of venting and kind of coping with what I was dealing with. But in the process of having a successful business, you always have to have that one piece that, that justifies how you made your money. So I invested in recording studios all throughout Atlanta, because at that time, the business of music was booming in Atlanta, and it was really growing really fast. With not enough musical facilities there. So all my street money went into recording studios. And I would just go in late night, write about what I'm going through, whatever I'm dealing with. And then that habit followed me in jail. And I ended up writing about being locked up. And that song changed my life. Because while I was in jail, I had an older guy who was a bunkie. That's what we call them, bunkies. His name was Booney Lowe. He was actually being transferred through Atlanta to go to death row. And we were cellmates. And he said to me, he said, do you even know why you went here? I said, yeah, you know, I just want to be rich. He said, I didn't want to be rich. Then what? I said, I'm a ball out. <laughs> he said, what does that mean? I said, well, you know, Fancy cars, big house, a lot of girls. And he said, okay, that sounds good. So how are you going to plan to achieve that? I said, well, I couldn't answer that. He said, because you're looking at me right now, I'm about to go get a needle stuck in me. And I was thinking the same way you was thinking. And then I happened to have a pad in my lap. He said, let me see that. I let him see it, and he's reading the lyrics to Locked Up, which is the song that I eventually put out. And he said, man, with all this talent and the success that you had in the street, if you put all that energy into your talent, it's no way you're not going to be successful. And I thought about that the whole night. And I woke up in the morning and I said, you know, Booney, I think you're right. I'm going to start my own company. I'm going to call it Convict Music. He said, that's the dumbest name I ever heard in my life. <laughs> he said, why the hell would you want to call it Convict? I said, Booney, honestly, I want to call it that because it's here that you woke me up. So every time a song comes on, I want to put jail bars at the top of it to remind me of where I don't want to be, and also to remind me that it was a conversation with you that changed my life. And he was like, you know what, young blood? Go ahead and do that. Right? And so it started. I finally get out, and I say to myself, where do I start? And then it hit me. I got a lot of favors 
Because at the time when I had all these recording studios, a lot of artists would use my recording studios for free. Because I didn't charge anybody. I wanted it to stay busy because I had to justify this money at the time. So the studio had to constantly be busy and studios at the time was a cash business. So everyone that worked in the studio remembered that I gave them that studio for free. So I started calling all the people that used the studio. And I said, listen, I need, you know, I'm gonna put out this record and I need some features on this record and I'm gonna need your help. I'm gonna send you the song and let me know what you think of it. And literally I sent about a hundred something songs to a hundred something artists. And we put out Locked Up and Locked Up became so big that I, I, I didn't have time to kind of think about what I wanted to do next. So we just kept putting out more records, more records, more records. And if you notice, at one point in my career, it was no way you could put on the radio without hearing me or someone else's song with me featured on it. A lot of those people, and I shouldn't be snitching, but use my studio. <coughs> <coughs> And it ended up happening that, with the success, I started getting enlightened because I started to travel. I started to meet new people, start experiencing different cultures. And then I started getting more inquiries from Fortune 500 companies to tell the story and to be a part of whatever product it is they're selling. And I started to realize that the more I sit in these board meetings, and hear how they're marketing a product, how they plan to move or influence people with a certain type of product or impact a certain type of product. I would walk in with their idea and completely 360 the whole situation to where they would have to revamp the whole marketing budget and start over. And I used a lot of, I could say, teachings that I didn't know would be valuable to me. Because as a hustler, you always think outside the box. You always think of how you could be different. You always think of how and what makes you different from everybody else. Matter of fact, what's the most creative way to present something to someone to be able to gain their trust and get their money? And one thing I realized in the business was that at that time, drug dealers move different because they will come to your territory, give you a sample, and if you like it, you will come back. And that never, never left my mind. So as time started moving forward, I started to realize that my mind is changing, my ideas are changing, me as a person, as a human, I'm changing. Because I'm going into these areas back home in Africa where I'm starting to remind myself back of my childhood and what I used to be. And as I started to create opportunities for myself, I started feeling really bad when I started seeing people with lack of opportunity. So, and at the time, hip hop was really flashy. You know, we have these big $100,000, $250,000 gold chains and Rolexes and diamonds. And I would go into these impoverished neighborhoods and seeing all the suffering. And I would actually feel bad and tuck my chain in because I couldn't see that I'm wearing a $250,000 chain and this kid here doesn't even have a plate to eat for lunch. And God knows what he's gonna eat for dinner. So I went back home and I said, no, this success wasn't made for me to just be rich because I don't feel comfortable being rich anymore. And that's what led me to say, I wanna start giving back and I wanna create a purpose for myself moving in and I want to start with Africa because that's the impact that I felt walking into that whole concept and idea. And then me being a U.S. citizen, I also thought that I always had special perks. And it also gave me a purpose to be able to say that this could be you one day and offer that freedom or that, that, you know, that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that idea that freedom does exist. And as I started creating my foundation, I named it confidence for a reason. But I always used the con as the beginning of every business I opened up, no different from when I did music, I put the jail bars at the top of it. 
because I started to realize that that word wasn't something that I should frown upon because it was that experience that allowed me to be who I am today. So I never wanted to be embarrassed by saying that I was once locked up and I was once a convict because I started reading back in history books of all the people that made major differences in the world. They were all confined at one point in their life. If it wasn't physical through government or isolated from a standpoint of having to be on a run or physically locked up, they all mentally was confined in a way to where it opened their minds to a bigger world. And it created and gave me the opportunity to say, let me step forward with my spiritual side of me before I step forward from my ambitious side. And I know that sounds kind of tricky, but one thing I started to realize is that failure never existed. We just say that because it's, it's a way of motivating ourselves to get to a certain place. But I always believe that if you feel in any kind of way that you failed, you're completely wrong. You didn't fail. You just didn't have all the information. So if you're after something or you're trying to get to a certain place or you have a specific goal of trying to reach and you don't reach that goal, it's only because you didn't have enough information. That's it. You didn't fail. You just got, you didn't have enough information. Because if you had all the information, you would have succeeded in whatever it is you think you're trying to achieve. And oftentimes, some things aren't never or should not never be evaluated by age. You know, most times people make that mistake of saying, well, I want to be at this certain level by the time I reach 25 or by the time I'm 35, I want to be achieving this. It's, a, it's okay to create goals, but don't bank on them because things is going to happen when God wants it to happen, not when you want it to happen. Now, you need to work towards it constantly, though, always perfecting your craft, always moving towards a growth impactual standpoint. But don't bank on an age goal and that become, because what happens is if you don't achieve it in that moment, most people start to give up or they start thinking, oh, I failed myself or I didn't do anything right. That's not always true. Sometimes things don't happen when you want it to happen. It happens when God wants it to happen. And that's the side that I think a lot of entrepreneurs miss, the spiritual side of your goal or the spiritual side of your success. And then you ask yourself, what is success? Is it fame and fortune? Does that measure what success is to you? Or is it faith? Like, me, success is faith. That's me. If God is not smiling upon me, I'm not successful. I don't care if I have a billion dollars in the bank, a hundred billion in the bank. Matter of fact, the biggest company in the world with a trillion dollars in the bank. What good am I if I have that much money sitting in the bank in the first place? When you have all these kids starving, all these problems that need to be solved, and you got a billion dollars in the bank, so we all have our own motives of why we do what we do. And we all have our own definition of what success is to you. But more than anything, you have to be, you have to be true to yourself as to what your thoughts and motivation is for what you do. And don't measure success by material things. Because we've seen hundreds of millions of companies that's worth billions of dollars be worth a billion today and then worth practically nothing tomorrow. So you have to think from a different level of what your satisfactions becomes to you. Because ultimately when you become that person that looks to impact from a standpoint of fortune, then it's a different way of how you structure your business. But if you're doing it just for a financial gain, then that's, 
very easy to structure because it's just about profit and loss. Me, I just choose to do it in a way to where anything I do get into, I want it to have an impact. I want to get into business that's going to help people. It's no different from Prince Khalid and what he just said. What problems are you solving? The most successful businesses in the world are businesses that solve a problem or that has a solution to whatever the issues are in life that you're facing or dealing with, right? So if you think along those lines, I think success is inevitable. It's just a matter of you working hard and patience in the process. Because our generation, we just have this idea that everything is supposed to happen right away. Because we've seen success. We've seen other people close to us have success. But half the time, we don't calculate the time in which it took to get there. And you shouldn't ever be in a rush to fail. Take your time with everything. Just be patient. Patient is literally the key to success. The hardest part for us is to wait. Because a lot of us never survived that wait. Most of us break down during that wait. That wait is serious because we're impatient. And when you're doing something that's never been done before, patience is even more required because it's never been done before. There's going to be a million mistakes made in the process. And there's going to be millions of solutions that may not be that solution for that specific thing, but may even branch you off to something else which may sidetrack you from your original goal. So all this time has to be calculated. And then as you're identifying partners and people that you think can help you get to that next stage, the hardest part is finding partners that believe in what you believe in or someone that you align with that understands what your goal is. Because it's hard to finance someone else's dream. If you're in business. Because the whole purpose of business is to double, triple your return. But if you put yourself in a position where you find a piece of your dream in someone else's, it makes it easier to invest. And the biggest problem I used to run into starting was finding money. Financing is always the biggest problem or the biggest challenge in everybody's business, especially startups. And you never really know where that startup is going to go. Because Prince Khalid is right, that 80-20 rule is real. <laughs> it's dead real. But the question is, how much are you willing to lose? I don't believe in losses. I always believe in gains. Because no matter how many times you do good, you're going to always be rewarded. So now, every investment to me, it's charity. Now, that may, be a very, that may be a very naive way of putting it when you're speaking about business. But that's me putting my spiritual side, again, up front. Because I just don't believe in having that much sitting away when I know I can apply it to changing somebody's life. Now, I may not make a million dollars off of that transaction, but I know I get a few good credits towards paradise. I'm cool with that. So, now entrepreneurs, I'm gonna take you just a little further. That message was to the investors. So, put some money aside to make money and put some money aside for extra credit. Entrepreneurs, whatever you do, do not alienate your gift. Because oftentimes we get into businesses that we know or we believe is gonna make us a lot of money right away, or we jump into businesses that we feel is the cool thing to do at the, at the time and the moment. And we may have a specific gift that may not be as attractive as the things you would want to get into because of the surroundings that you're surrounded by. 
Now, one thing I've realized is that when you're great at something, you do it a lot. And oftentimes you do it a lot because you're passionate about it and you just love it. So anything that you love to do, you're going to always do it a lot. You'll do it for free because you love it so much. And those are the kind of things that you want to gear your business towards. Because when you do something a lot, you become great at it. And anything that you're great at, people will pay you for that service. Let me just throw something out the sky, just let's say far away, from, let's say hypothetically, I love to cook. And I'm gonna use this as an example. I just love to cook. Not, I'm, I'm not a real chef, but I'm just saying the obvious person. You love to cook. And you just do this just for no reason. You go to the garden, you pick a little tomato and some you know, carrot or whatever, and you just make an amazing recipe out of it because this is something you just love to do. Then you find yourself cooking for the family for Thanksgiving because everybody knows that you love to cook and you make great dishes. Now you're cooking up for, for the family. And everybody's like, oh, man, Ali, oh, he's an amazing chef. He cooks for the family every Thanksgiving. I got a friend that works at the restaurant. I probably can get your job as a chef. He goes to the friend, listen, I have a friend. He's an amazing chef. He cooks for us every Thanksgiving. Let's give him a shot and see what he comes up with. He say, okay, cool. You know what? I'll give him a shot for the weekend and see how he does. If my customers like it, I'll hire him. He goes and cooks at the restaurant. Something he loves to do. And boom, everyone in the restaurant loves him. Now he's cooking every week. So now every week this guy brings in a crowd because he just loves to cook. And everybody loves his cooking. Now the restaurant is excited. So now he gets to the point where he actually is cooking for the restaurant. And someone important walks in and eats and like, man, who's that chef? I like the way he seasons. He now knows that he's existing. And he wants to open up a new restaurant and needs a head chef. So he thinks of that guy that works every week at this deli and he becomes now the head chef of the restaurant. He had no intentions of being a head chef of a restaurant when he was just cooking for the Thanksgiving. So now he's a head chef of the restaurant. His name is in lights. All the major celebrities are coming to the restaurant because Chef Ali is there cooking and all. He's amazing. You got to hear the curry goat. So now he's there. Corporations, Fortune 500s are now using the restaurant for sponsorship and gathering all these people. And they're like, man, this, this barbecue sauce is just amazing. We need to franchise this. So they go to Chef Ali. Ali, look, is it okay if we franchise the barbecue sauce? So popular in this restaurant. How can we make business? Now he has his own barbecue sauce, and they find distribution. It's in all the major grocery stores and Whole Foods and all these places. Now, mind you, this is a guy that just loves to cook. And as he's going, all these opportunities pop up. And from that, he becomes a product in the store to own his own grocery store. Then he starts buying out franchises, other Whole Foods and other Kroger's and other Publix's and other Ralph's. So now he's this mogul with multiple grocery stores, multiple restaurants, all because he just loved to cook. That was just a simple example. And this can happen with any business or any passion or anything that you're just great at. So ultimately, if you just harness that gift that you have, because I always believe that God gave everyone a specific gift that will be their freedom and that will be their way out of whatever they're dealing with. If you just harness that and you build a model around that, you'll get to where you're going 50 times faster than trying to start from scratch or doing something that you're not really that talented at or doing something that you just think is the cool thing to do. When you're already great at something, your odds of being successful at it is already cut in half. Now it's a matter of how to execute that and surrounding your people around people that understands that sector of business and moving it forward. And last but not least, Prince Khaled, you said a lot of great things I'm peeping up on, is the pitch. How can you convince someone that this is worth investing in? That's all passion. All passion. Because when they can see that you believe yourself, they can now believe in you. And then your road to success is inevitable. And then whatever you do after that, Bismillah, just keep God first, and inshallah, everything will work out. Thank you.